Hello everyone. Um, welcome in the research atelier. Hello iedereen, welkom in het research atelier. Um, yeah, this is the very first edition of our five series um, of inclusivity. Um, we're here in the Basserij in Rotterdam in my personal atelier. And yeah, today I've got Sam with me. Yes. And, and I'm just going to talk a little bit about why we started a virtual gallery. Um, well, it started when I got this RTA, and I just felt very privileged of having this space. Obviously, during the Corona time, um, space and time, which is very, very valuable. And I was just very intrigued by the idea of making work towards inclusivity, but also supporting other artists um, and designers in their work and their research towards um, a more inc inclusive design and art industry. Um, myself, I make work about inclusivity within the fashion industry. Um, I design clothes based on people's data, um, trying to make more personalized fashion. And yeah, I'm just wondering how many different kinds of inclusivity there are. And today, yeah, I invited Sam to show a bit about her practice. Mm, yeah, we came on this idea to um, research inclusivity when Sam was here actually in this space with me and was looking for a space to exhibit her work, uh, which I was very much a fan of, and I was lucky to be, yeah, to contribute to her work as well in the last two years. That's true. Um, Sam, I met Sam in London, um, but Sam graduated from Antwerp, St. Lucas School of Arts and Design, um, and afterwards she went to London and studied at St. St. Martins in London. Um, she also holds a Bachelor of Science from the Erasmus University in Rotterdam. She's a research associate at TRAIN, the Research Center for Transnational Art, Identity and Nation. And she's currently undertaking her master at Rotterdam's Spitzwart Institute. <sighs> that's a lot. <laughs> yeah, that's a lot. <laughs> um, I'm just going to ask Sam the question, what can we expect today? Um, so thank you for your introduction, Gianni. And I just want to thank you because, um, you know, when I came here, we, we've had been having like a, a two-year collaboration and some of the work that you'll see here in the film is the fruition of our, you know, collaboration. And I remember in London you were saying, wow, you should really print these photos. He's my main doc like person who documents my performances. And I kept thinking, I don't know how to do that. So perhaps today is like, well, today I feel like uh, the prints have come together in your gallery space, which is amazing. Um, and, um, but first and foremost, when you um, approached me with Het Research Atelier as an initiative, I was looking for a place to do a lecture performance and to show a video. So that's kind of like what this event will be about. Um, what we can, yeah, so that's what we're, <laughs> basically what, what you can expect well. today is us chatting about the title, uh, which is, has been a very captivating title, uh, so it seems it's been circulating among uh, social media a little bit, and we're going, we're going to chat about that um, afterwards. The film is going to start at 8 p.m., uh, Holland time, so Dutch time, and my lecture performance is starting at quarter past eight and the Q&A starts at half past eight. So stay tuned, there's a lot that's gonna happen. But right now, I would like to talk about the title. The title, yeah. what does diversity mean if white yeah. curators are still at the center? Yes, so yeah. What does diversity mean if white curators are still at the center? So I kind of wrote it out because it's quite a lengthy or quite complex situation and to be honest, my work is not about inclusivity or diversity at all. And any opportunity that I've had before, I've actually always avoided this question. So this is a very rare occasion, and it's because you're my friend that I will speak about diversity and inclusivity. I am of personal opinion that if my work was completely about this topic, it would be very boring and it would center, I guess, um, the white art world the whole time, but it doesn't. So I was rather ambivalent but I would like to then actually share um, how I came up with this title um, in a very sincere way and also confess that I don't have any answers to this million dollar question. 
So I'm going to read that out, if I may. Um, I was inspired to write this title and blurb about two, three weeks ago. Um, I was in an arranged meeting with someone from a local contemporary arts institute. Let's say it's the biggest one here in Rotterdam. The nature of this meeting was ambiguous for both parties and it resulted in an awkward conversation. I don't regularly meet curators or program makers. I work independently. And so meeting this person kind of startled me. In this conversation, there was very little, in, little interest in who I was as a person and a maker, what my work looks like, sounds like, or feels like, or what inspires me. This person was interested in discussing their art and philosophical theories or linking any word I said to any art buzzwords. They did not actually listen to what I had to say. Later that day, I went to the action and the cashier at the action was better at reading the room and taking verbal and nonverbal cues than this actual person. So when I came home, I was really confused and upset. But what I understood was that I wasn't upset at this part person in particular. I was upset because to me, they embodied the epitome of this global contemporary art scene and their obsession with art theory. I don't really have a problem with art theory, but it's that art theory is usually written by art critics and art writers and then read by the art curators and art program makers. And so they're really it's really like loved within the circle. Um, and when I speak to other artists, they really don't feel like this art lingo or their, their, this art theory really benefits them, actually it paralyzes them. So in a sense, a whole part of the art world has created this lingua franca where they're fluent in it and we as artists are really left behind and we do really find it helpful. So what irritates me the most is its hypocrisy. This institution was rebranding itself as some sort of safe space with all forms of care, such as free yoga, reading tarot cards, or having sage burned through the building. But I felt they were so unaware of their neo-colonial gestures. They were ignorant of the fact that for decades, any form of ethnic spirituality in this country was ridiculed, called irrational, branded as dangerous, and the reason for white Dutch people to be so racist that for many people living here was dangerous. To simply practice religion in this country meant to be in perpetual danger. For many people of color, Western countries' intervention in their country of origin is the reason of their loss of ethnic spirituality and the tracing back of it is often a diasporic community's effort of many decades. For now an institution to sell you back cherry-picked spirituality praxis and community care off the back of some hyped-up texts, which only circulates within elitist art circles, is really crazy to me. Well, Sam, don't you think you're actually being quite harsh? Don't you think they're just trying really hard? Are you? The person I spoke to was white. They were an expat who speaks English, cannot speak Dutch, does not even live in Rotterdam, but in Amsterdam. I'm not trying to expat bash here or to be conservative, but are you telling me that not even a Dutch person, white or non-white, from Rotterdam is eligible to fill in any position at an important local art institution? What are they missing? Oh, I guess they don't speak the same speak, they don't talk the talk or look the part. So I propose to continue discussing this question about diversity after I do my film and lecture performance. But thank you for listening well, to my rant. <laughs> Such an amazing story. I think this is very relatable for me as a person as well, as an artist, as a designer. Um, if you feel that this story relates to you, please write it in the chat, uh, in the comment section. If you have any questions for Sam, please write those in the comment section as well. We will answer those uh, during the Q&A. Um, I'm going to, um, I want to give the context of the film that you're about to see because um, basically the story of inclusivity is obviously a part of my artistry only because I'm a person of color. 
and the actual thing that I'm about to show is actually my work, which is something freestanding from this whole story, obviously because I'm a person who wants to make work, and that is sincere, and it is sincere to my, myself, basically. So the film you're about to see is actually not a work in itself. It is an overview that I made for my teachers at the Piet Swart Institute, which is the school where I'm currently at. Um, my year was troublesome because of two different inc incidents which made making work quite difficult and so I was productive in only short increments of time. So please see this film not as a work but as a student's attempt to open up her world to her teachers so as to lay a foundation for a second year of graduate school. Well, and let's see it. Film, yeah. <laughs> Reflection 1, Life and Art, 31st of March, 2021. Today I feel good. When I was cleaning my room and listening to an old soca mix from 2013, it's music I'm not familiar with, but one of my best friends loves, I suddenly felt insecure. At Chertis' Das Art Group Kit, I said a few things very confidently, but hours later, as I was processing the day through doing and listening, I felt insecure. I'm not an expert, I don't know what I'm saying, I said to my boyfriend as he came out of the bathroom. He stopped and said, no, I feel proud of you. It felt like your commentary was the accumulation of your last two months of research, and I'm incredibly proud of you for coming forward and applying what you've learned. If there's one environment where you should be able to test your ideas, it should be there. I can't sum up what has happened in the last few months. Let's say I was confronted with the life I had left 10 years ago. The Netherlands and my family, my mom, my dad, and my brother. My father is dead. My mom is back from Cambodia after a corona nightmare, and my brother is still a dickhead. In the last 10 years that I, was, that I wasn't here, I felt terribly free. I once described that what I followed was the logical end of the female ethnic emancipation from a white male's perspective. Leave your family, choose your own freedom, fuck around YOLO. My Asian therapist in Sydney said a decade ago, she was a trainee and part of my old uni, my home's toxic and when I go back and visit, I should stay in a hotel. I missed my parents terribly for the last 10 years and now my dad is dead. That went dark quickly, I am not upset. What I'm now convinced of is this particular Western logic is dead. When I was away for 10 years, I learned how Dutch and how un-Dutch I am. Meticulous and particular, my Dutch traits. But I cannot with its sarcasm. I cannot with its coldness. It brings tears to my eyes. It's hard to describe what I've seen. I keep coming back to some sort of lecture about context and culture, how a particular context can bring you down and make you small. Another context can lift you to higher levels. Nurturing spaces, loving souls, you get me. But what I've learned lately from life and from a new season of Last Chance You, the basketball one, it's about the way you react to adverse situations, because life is going to give you curveballs regardless. It's about the way you react to it. I pray for strength and braveness that I can emerge from adverse situations and rise above it. Not all is lost. Today I feel good because I set my thing freely and I played my decks again since I lost my dad. I was instantly transported to London, 2018-19. The way I played the decks is rough because I was taught on the fly. I laughed and said, the way, I play, the way I play the decks is sloppy and like with no direction, just like how you handle your cooking. My boyfriend never follows a recipe. But in London I could do that because the culture corrected me. You're quickly corrected. They made sure I didn't play some weird shit. I feel like I follow the breadcrumbs. A few things I say contradicts, but I believe in it. One, I avoid the gospel of the written word. Second, life consists of lessons. And third, some people's really destined to do a thing, but it's never in isolation. A doctor needs its patients. A teacher needs students. A preacher needs to preach someone. Fourth, there's a really weird imbalance between what you say convincingly as a maker, 
when you make something as a maker, but it's actually really a question, a proposition, because you genuinely don't know, and because you put it into existence, it becomes real. Realer than real, it's magic. Reflection two, practice and research, 1st of April, 2021. Loved moving into the studio, I never had a studio before. I'm still not accustomed to it. I thrifted all around Riddekerk, a Christian village outside of Rotterdam, and enjoyed the what is a studio to me challenge. I streamed every Thursday Eve for two months with a co Rotterdammer and hosted a few guests in it. Two of them were inspired and got their own studio afterwards. It was a joy for the short time that I was here. I learned how to weld, how to code in JavaScript, to build a strong wooden structure, how to DJ on CDJs, and how to stream in HD quality. I took Cambodian lessons and followed a 10-week Theravada Buddhist course. This was the year of DIY learning. And health-wise, it felt good too. I ate more, slept better, tried to be a better person. Lately, my thinking revolves around an aspect I suspect at, to be at the heart of most arts outside of Western logic. For the arts to be largely be determined and molded by a community over time. I find this notion fascinating and familiar, truesome and contradicting, and now I've complicated my own journey. I ask myself, how do I move as an individual artist without mimicking Western logic? This generally resu resulted in a shift in collecting references. I already was, but now I'm even more so focused on groups of people doing similar things instead of individuals doing something innovative. The world of references moved from contemporary art to almost everything else, which I found liberating. My concern is to create a foundation that is rooted in neither pure post-colonial nor pure pre-colonial thought, but both of here and there. I was raised in a sheltered Cambodian community with mostly ex-farmers and ex-soldiers as our seniors, in a small Dutch town where emotional and spiritual imagination was practically forbidden under the guise of Dutch severity, Nederlandse nuchterheid. Sometimes my worlds would collide when my peers, juniors and seniors shared their multiple worlds with me and accidental spaces were created where souls flight freely. I spent a lot of time meditating on lives that passed. Never formulaic, I try to gain a better sense for the phases of life. A few things are certain. Once you are young, you will die, you will gain, and you will lose. The rest, I'm not so sure. Nowadays, an academic journal article, Nupentanel, a gossip, and a Buddhist monk have the same ability to activate me. Not very much and not very little. I used to be concerned with how to do your own thing without creating binaries, to emancipate oneself from being the opposite of what you claim you aren't. After a little stint with Jal de Luz's difference, I realized I don't want to follow logic to make sense of reality. I've taken an accepting approach to lost family, history, archive, and arts without overtly referencing new age's spirituality of positivity, nor giving into concepts of my own obscure religious heritage to relieve me from my sadness and discomfort. I will continue and try and make sense of life, and my work is my testament of doing so sincerely. Sometimes it looks really impressive, sometimes it doesn't. Sometimes I am a career self-sabotager. Sometimes I really want to succeed. Sometimes I'm happy and sometimes I'm sad. Reflection three, life after death, 2nd of April, 2021. One of my friends from Antwerp called me today. She's half Thai, half Dutch, Belgian race, like a sister. She said, do you remember? On the last day of my visit to you in London, I asked you what your biggest fear was. We were joking around, asking each other these super deep questions. I couldn't remember. Your answer was one of your parents dying. And out of the blue, you started crying. Honestly, I never thought you would respond like this because you guys are just so far apart and you hardly speak about them. You said they are the source of my strength. I was taken aback by my own response but it did sound like me. I said, it's true. That was my biggest fear. Man, imagine the biggest fear of your life coming true. What do you do then? Who are you then after that?
<laughs> wow. That's it. Wow, son. Wow. Yesterday, yeah, yesterday we were like building up the, exp the exhibition, and Sam reminded me of how we met. And she told me, like, in the beginning, you didn't really understand my work. And I didn't, obviously I didn't. I had no clue what her very personal kind of performance art actually meant. And through working with Sam and really, yeah, going with her, following her with my camera, um, made me understood the importance of this kind of exclusive personal moments that she captures about her culture about her views, and yeah, to tap in on that, someone asked a question, uh, Micah. A lot of the scenes in your film seem to be from everyday life and art projects still in process. Do you often record your everyday life and work? And if so, why is this important to you? Well, Micah, uh, thank you for your question. I have been regularly recording bits and bobs in my life since I got this camera, which was probably January 2020. Um, and when I was harassed on the street in London, I realized that um, if reflecting upon other sort of like life-changing moments, I would often distort them in my head and make them bigger or smaller than they usually are. So for me to be able to revisit really intense moments and not dis like stain them with my current feeling, I thought it would be very helpful to record them. But as you know, I also have a diary. So I have, uh, yeah, for some reason, I, feel, I find it very uh, important to record things. In the last 10 years, I've lived for three years in Sydney, three years in Antwerp, three years in London, in Cambodia and in Berlin, where I've met so many different people and just came across so many beautiful souls. But I'm always a different person in all these different places. And if that person is not there, the memory will fade. So sometimes it feels like I can't remember what happened in the last 10 years. And we were just saying before, like, you're the only person that is in Rotterdam that has seen me in action in London. And trust me, so much has happened in London. <laughs> like, this was only, like, literally the last one month which was like one minute, but I was there for three years and it has changed my life. So you were a big part of that. Uh, you've seen it all and you see, you've seen everyone that kind of like uh, came about in my life. So it was very important for me to try and capture it just for the sake of it, yeah. Well, thank you. No um, worries. Why is inclusivity important? Well, that's a good question. So <laughs> it's actually, one of the most annoying questions on this planet because it's like, it's like you're begging for a position. Why is not ignoring me or other people of color important? Or why is not being a racist important? Basically, nobody wants to be a racist, so stop being a racist. Like, I feel when I do diversity work, because I'm a research consultant for arts organizations in the UK, and I help these people um, I kind of realize how undiverse they are by looking at their numbers or looking at the programs. And um, I can't remember what I was trying to say, but basically it's just really important. Yeah. Yeah. So what can these institutions <laughs> can do, yeah. do to support the Um So based off the work that I do, so that's not the artist work because artists aren't supposed to do this type of work. Um, people are supposed to just do it like, by default to not dismiss, ignore, exclude uh, non-people of color, like people of color. And so um, what um, institutions can do, and I wrote this down, is they need to confront themselves with the lack of ethnic diversity. And they need to evaluate their programming, funding, and partners. And this is then followed by a very thorough action plan uh, and diversity policy that where they centralize um, people of color artists and makers and they need to create funds mm -hmm. and support specifically for people of color artists and like not make them do the dirty work so not be in the position that I'm sometimes in where I have to 
solve their inclusivity problem, which stems from fucking, sorry, from like decades ago. Um, they need to stop using methodo methodological logic on all artists because trust me, I'm speaking for artists. They don't love this art theory. It's bullshit. Well, it's not bullshit, but it's basically, it's not helpful. It's paralyzing. It's not poetic at all. So um, I'm making a plea for all artists to be released from the curator's grip of methodological logic and research. <laughs> um, institutions need to employ people who speak the local language. So if you're working here in Rotterdam, speak Dutch, basically. And that sounds very conservative because I'm a person whose parents had a hard time speaking Dutch. But I don't like the double standards. I don't like the classism. If you come here as an expat and you actually are able to um, navigate the world in English, that's fine. But it has a double standardness to it, and especially when it comes to trying to find a way to anchor the local institution with the local um, like people on the streets, basically, so the local public, because in this way, otherwise, everyone will be cons constantly excluded, like how I felt excluded at this local art institution. It was like, I basically felt like it doesn't really matter what language I speak at some point. At some point, somebody above me, in some sense, will have learned a different lingo, and I'm excluded again, so fuck that shit. Um, Institutions need to widen the scope as to what constitutes as knowledge. So this comes back to the art theory and art logic. They're basically, this all focused on Western canon mm. and critiques thereof. So when we're talking about Deleuze or when we're talking about Baudrillard or all these Western philosophers, and when people are critiquing that, they're completely critiquing. They're just in their own little bubble. Whereas when you look left and right or front and center, there are many centers of knowledge and this is completely dis disregarded whatsoever in any sort of conversation in the arts. So you would say that the best work, like the best art and design about inclusivity is not directly about inclusivity? Um, if, you're a, if you're an ethnic, cultural, different person from white, basically, mm -hmm. it makes no sense to see yourself as inclusive. You're just a person, like you're, a person, a human being with integrity in your own center. And the question of inclusivity only pertains to a white person because they are, they have the power to include or exclude. So who are we talking about when we're talking about inclusivity? Like I'm still giving power to the white Western person to include me or exclude me. Mm -hmm. Whereas I feel like what I've been doing for ages, for years, and you've seen it, I've always included myself and my people in my own inclusive world. So there is no, we don't talk about inclusivity or diversity, we're just us in it. Okay, so. so to answer Dan's question, what do you advise other artists to do to be more inclusive? Oh, so, um, gee. I can't really speak for other people to be honest, <laughs> but I can like, obviously I can speak for institutions because they do have like um, a moral responsibility because one is public money, second, like they inform like what is general knowledge in places like the Netherlands or Rotterdam or whatever. So they have like a particular standard that they um, sort of adhere to. So when, when you're excluded from, a, from the dominant narrative all the time, you're basically excluded from social life and that's when you, you know, make sure that like this is perpetuating problems across like diasporic communities. As for a maker or an artist, that's just me speaking to you as a human being, do you get me? Like that's basically asking how to be a non-racist, open-minded person. <laughs> so my advice would be to be curious, to ask questions, to be very aware of your own position. Um, and that for instance, some people might have been asked the same question about their ethnic diversity a gazillion times. Like if I would be like, basically being Cambodian is not very popular, so I can't com count the, the times that somebody has asked me if, if Cambodia is in South America or like what Cambodia is mm -hmm. or, do you know what I'm saying? Like, do you speak Asian? Like, no. So be mindful of who you speak to, but that's basically just normal. Like, but like, you should not be rude to anyone anyway. A spicy question. Okay. Can I read it first? 
from Rose. Uh, yeah. To what extent is it okay to mix another culture in your work, which is not yours? Oh, the cultural appropriation question. Yes. I don't know, B, like, um, I can only speak from my position, obviously, so, like, from me as a person, because I can't say from, like, a black person's perspective, oh, if you do this, then it's cool. Or I can't say from next Cambodian person, if you do this, it's cool. It's a very, very thin line. And to be honest, in this day and age, it's very hard because, um, thank God, like, you know, we are able to police each other, but it's also pretty shit because a lot of, like, we've been remixing for, like, time. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Like, we've been remixing for a long time. We've been remixing as people as well. So it's very hard to be quite conservative and to be so linear and uh, like, you know, boundary making um, in this day and age. It feels, um, it feels like, uh, yeah, it's just actually a really hard question. So I think yeah. try and like difference. not be disrespectful basically. The and difference between like cultural appropriation and like just an intercultural practice. Yeah, I feel like, oh. I feel like um, I don't have a license, to be honest, and I, I do it, even, like not even without, but um, I, my, all artistic references and all licenses are 99% are or 80% of the time based on people that are alive and that are in my community. So I speak to them every single week or whatever. So when something is offensive, they will come and chat to me and then I will, have, I will respect them because we are in each other's community and I cannot ignore them or bash them or talk them down. Um, they are seniors, peers, uh, juniors to me whom I've you know, learned something from and used in my practice. So for me, I think that has helped, I wouldn't say has solved it, this issue of cultural appropriation, but actually has helped um, that people who have authority to say something over their ethnic culture and that, that they were able to speak to me directly and step in and say, Sam, you can't do that. That's it. I think that's the right answer. Yeah. <laughs> um, another question from Micah. When you said, I avoid the gospel of, of the written words, what did you mean by that? What is your relationship to the written text in art, education, and faith? That's a good question, Micah. Um, and I think it's very important that you pose this question specifically. Mm. I think I have a difficult relationship with text and that I am at the moment have a particular position in it where I abstain, like stay away from texts. It is after a long um, encounter with texts as um, the truth. So in a sense, I'm, I'm using the word gospel as to say, as an equivalent to the truth. And this has been the truth of the Western academia. So when I went to Erasmus University, University of Sydney, St. Lucas Arts of School and Design, and Central St. Martins, and when I was a research assistant, most, a, a lot of the wrongdoings towards um, genocide of um, ethnic communities, colonization, has been, I would say, um, talked, right? Like, I can't really find the words, but like the written word has not helped them, like has actually helped them to come into the stage where they found it in their right to come and colonize and to come and enslave and to displace one people to another place. And that's how I have found it very difficult to um, engage with, the, with texts as much as I did before. And it's probably a knee-jerk reaction to uh, being entangled with text for a long time. So that's a very long answer, but I hope you understand, Micah. 
There's one more question. Yeah. Um, from Siniat. What do you think universities can do to encourage inclusivity? Oh, that's a really good question. I think. If they should. I, uh, absolutely. I really, yeah, uh, absolutely. Mm. It's similar to an institution where you need to employ people who are of uh, a different ethnic cultural backgrounds. And, um, but I think in terms with uh, institutions or like universities, it's a question about um, knowledge. And Thinking as a means of mental health support has allowed you to not care too much about theory in the sphere of academic art, art for the sake of art and abstain from text. Wait, can you? Demand and read it from Janet. Do you feel like, hi Janet, do you feel like art making as a means of mental health support has allowed you not to care too much about theory in the sphere? Um, Art making, art making has allowed me to be f free and be myself, really. So that means whatever I need at the moment, which is you know probably some mental health sort of thing because of my dad in it. So um, yeah, art has really helped me through that period. It's like actually I was think I was really thinking like I think um, it was. I've been an artist for a very long time and I've been doing art for a very long time and I've do, been doing it in increments, but uh, when my father passed, the only thing I could do was lie on the sofa and draw. And I was like, rah, this is like really sick that I can actually, that I need to do something to get through this period, obviously, because it's four months lying on the sofa. And um, that, <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm getting distracted. And. Um, that I have these tools and so I can do that. So I feel like, yeah, I l care less about the theory through making art. Yeah, basically, because I think if, it's, if I spent more time making the work, then obviously I care a little less about the theory. And also I feel like I'm able to explore whatever I mean by myself anyway. So, uh, I'm waiting for my host to come back. Thank you for your question. Hi. Hi. So, you've actually come to an end. Yeah, I really am I, ready to end this. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, first of all, I want to thank everyone for being here um, virtually in my atelier uh, at the very first um, exhibition about inclusivity. Um, thank you, Sam, for bringing in a very important question um, that we've explored and very importantly couldn't answer as it's a very big and important question we should all think about. I would like to thank the Vassalai, um, yeah, for just allowing me to have the space. Um, I would like to thank the Stichting Dromendaat for supporting us financially to make this happen. I would like to I'd like to thank Sam again for Cheers. being here. <laughs> I would like to thank my my crew, and I would like to thank everyone who's here and uh, Sam's guest. Before we um, log off, I'd like to invite everyone to a newly opened exhibition, which is completely online. It's called Satu Studio. It's an online platform, and you can now access it. Usually, um, you're invited through a postcard with like my own stamp. But right now, for a short period of time, you can access my work as well. And um, if you go to the website called satu.studio, and there's a password, which is rdam, R-D-A-M, 010, and I think it is in the chat, um, you can view my latest work. So thank you for having me. Yes, you're welcome. And uh, have a great evening. Bye.